Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the public forum here of the group exhibit Hydrogen Fuel Cells and Batteries. You're very welcome to the panel discussion coming up about green hydrogen. We will look at the foundation for sector coupling between electricity, mobility and heat. And I uh, would like to invite you all to have a seat here, have a drink on the house uh, and to participate in this discussion uh, with, uh, with some high-ranking uh, Representatives, I would like to welcome Werner Diewald. He is right next to me. He is chairman of the Deutsche Wasserstoff- und Brennstoffzellenverband e.V. Uh, I would like to welcome Bart Bieboig right next to him. Uh, he is executive director of the Fuel Cells and Hydrogen Joint Undertaking. I'd like to welcome Dr. Katrin Goldammer. She is on the board of directors of HYPOS, the Hydrogen Power Storage and Solution East Germany. At the same time, Managing Director of Rainer Limoin Institute. Welcome to you as well. And uh, to my opposite, Dr. Uffe Borup. He is uh, Vice President Technology of Nell Hydrogen Solutions from Norway. So whenever you have a question or you would like to discuss with my uh, partners here on stage, just raise your hand. I'll be with the microphone right with you. Mr. Diewald, uh, we are talking about green hydrogen, and uh, but hyd green hydrogen should be produced by electrolyzers with energy from renewable sources. But uh, this is only a goal. The reality is some, somewhat different at the moment. As far as I know, uh, about 75% of the hydrogen we use nowadays, and there are a lot of use already uh, nowadays for hydrogen, we produce by steam reforming fossil fuels, I guess. Yes, that is right. <laughs> but um, it's a sad situation, isn't it? We should <laughs> no, change not it. situation. I think that is a situation, like in, uh, in a lot of areas. Uh, if you look to transport sector or electricity sector in the past, but we now have learned we have to save our climate, and so we change the system. And I think so. We are now on the point that we have to change the production of hydrogen. Uh, one, one side for, for climate reasons, on the other side we have the problem in the electricity system and we need some device which help us to integrate more the flexible or volatile um, green electricity production. And we believe, or I'm sure, that the electrolyzers, the green hydrogen, can be very helpful and can really support the integration of renewable energies. And in the same effect, we have the saving or the reduction of um, CO2, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, in the fuel sector. And after the fuel sector, we have the transport sector. So that is really a good development. We see it on the fair here. That is good. I think now we start to change the system. Dr. Goldheimer, but one could say we are on the edge of uh, energy transition in, in Germany, but even in, in Europe, because there are a lot of uh, renewable energy coming in, but in form of electricity, but where we need the energy is mostly in heating and transport. And there's something like a missing link in between, wouldn't you say? Yes, that's right. And um, one reason why you would say that is probably because of the carbon emissions, right? Which, at least when you look at Germany, are um, substantial coming from the mobility or the transport sector. And um, one goal could be, or one basic line that people use is always to electrify transport. And I'd like to ask what options we have. In Germany, at least, the discussion usually goes two ways. There is a um, big proportion of, of people and organizations supporting battery electric vehicles. Um, but I'd also like to raise the question of from both the co consumer side and the electricity system side what that would mean. And this is where the fuel cell and the hydrogen as a fuel comes in. A car which can be easily and um, very quickly refueled and can run a long distance and also a flexibility option uh, for the electricity system. So as an electrical engineer, I'm most concerned about the electricity system and I'd like to see a share of hydrogen and fuel cells integrated there. 
But Mr. Bieberg, we always forget there is already a lot of hydrogen there, which is not green really, but it's a byproduct, by chemical process, and it's it's normally it's burned, you know. So uh, shouldn't we use this byproduct as well for transport systems? What do you think? Oh, absolutely, and actually this happening already uh, in several countries in Europe, but not only in Europe, but also in China and other parts of the world. So actually we have, uh, because we are a, a public-private partnership, we are actually a funding uh, body um, from the European Commission with the industry together. And actually we had fund a project uh, in, in Belgium, one, which uh, the company Solve had a byproduct uh, for uh, with uh, hydrogen. And actually the buses in Antwerp are fueled with that byproduct. But similar situation happens also in Germany here uh, near the Köln area. So there is have a very... Uh, cheap hydrogen, actually 3.8 euro per kilogram, which is very, very cheap. Uh, it's a byproduct, and that's why also in Köln has decided to go for hydrogen buses. They will order, they have uh, joined one of our bus programs uh, with, uh, I think, 20 buses, and I heard that they will in future order more hydrogen buses. So, because it can be, as a byproduct, it can be very cheap, and it's actually cheaper than when you go to diesel. So. But when we, get, when we get into bigger scales, Mr. Diewald, uh, it won't last anymore. We, we need more hydrogen. So what do you think about is we, we need some sector coupling between we have the gas grid, we have the electrical grid, uh, uh, we have the chemical grid. How could that perfectly fit together? What would you say? Perfectly. I don't know if you find it every time. Perfect uh, system. But of course, we can use, uh, we see the problem in the electricity transport system. We want to erect new lines. It's very difficult to get the acceptance from the public. So it, it's on the hand to use the gas pipeline system. In the past, we use it too. If it's town gas, stadt gas, we have 50% hydrogen in the gas system. So for me, it's not obviously, or I don't understand why it should be now a problem. So I think we have to use it. There are a lot of million, billions of euros in the ground for transport energy from one point to the other point, and in the future it will be more decarbonized gas. And so we have to use it. We have now to find solution how many percents of green hydrogen or hydrogen we can use in the natural gas pipeline because there is industry connected to them and so. So, of course, we, we don't need a break in our economic. But I think there is a possibility, especially with hydrogen, to go step by step and increase the percents of hydrogen in the gas, uh, gas system. And I think that is, a good inf or that is a good point on that. It don't cost additional money. So new gr electricity grid costs money. Somebody have to pay it. That is for free. Uh, Dr. Borup Nell is a global company from Norway delivering solutions to produce, to store and to distribute hydrogen from renewable energy. So you wouldn't do steam reforming at all, would you? No, I mean, we, we are promoting the electrolyzer and uh, we see a perfect match with uh, the, the dropping cost of the, the green electricity. Uh, it's a perfect match to now reintroduce the electrolyzer is the main uh, production equipment for, for green hydrogen production. It's a perfect uh, fit. We have made these electrolyzers for 90 years. So, um, of course, they have been a bit outcompeted by the steam reformer uh, for <laughs> fertilizer production for, for three decades. But now, actually, we start to see the, the electricity cost is now coming down. So it, it will start to make sense again, also on an economical uh, scale. And, and we see a lot of interest now to reintroduce these electrolyzers also in very large scale systems for refineries or fertilizer production, stuff like this. And, and you cover the whole value chain from, from hydrogen production up to manufacturing hydrogen fueling stations, the, the, the whole chain. It's very interesting what's going on in Norway. So, so a lot of people in Germany are looking at it very closely yes. uh, because you have already 100,000 battery electric vehicles in Norway on your streets at a population of only 5.2 million people. You have also to mention that one. And uh, you intend to phase out all fossil fuel powered automobiles by 2025. Very ambitious, I would say. You, do you believe your government? Um, yes, I think, that we, I think it's been shown that uh, this is possible. The, the, the penetration of uh, electric driven uh, vehicles is now over 20% of all new cars sold. Uh, through, uh, you can say, generous 
schemes that make it uh, attractive to people. And we've seen that with the battery cars, and uh, I'm, I'm very sure as soon as, as uh, we have the network available that we're building right now with 20 stations uh, all across uh, Norway, uh, and, and getting the cars uh, readily available for the consumers, they will, uh, they will uh, embrace them. I'm sure we you can, will you build can up sell a network a of, of uh, hydrogen fueling stations. Yeah. Oh, yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. When, when uh, will they be ready? So uh, they will all be built by 2020 together with uh, Uno X. So we, they will be located in all the southern part of, you can say, half of Norway will have a fully uh, rolled out network. And, and if you bring the cars to Norway, you can sell 10,000 fuel cell cars tomorrow. It's no problem. Okay, I'm so so the Norwegians don't. They will love it. They they can <laughs> they can park for free in Oslo. They don't pay the road taxes, and the, and the toll, and they have uh, and it, it it makes sense. So they can actually pay a little bit more because both in Norway and Denmark we have very high uh, taxes on cars on regular cars. That's so even if it's a bit more expensive uh -huh. for the end user, he will still pick this one because it it will be the same as you know buying a Volkswagen Passat or something. Same Does course. Elon Musk know this already? Oh, because yeah. he's he keep, keep he keeps saying loves, uh, uh, fuel cell cars are bullshit. Ah, right. That's right. I mean, he's promoting his thing. That's, that's fine. <laughs> okay. I think there will be room for both uh, type of vehicles. Okay. Uh, Dr. Goldheimer, you're representing Hypos, the hydrogen power storage and solution East Germany. Are there special conditions for green hydrogen in East Germany? Yes, it's interesting that you note the uh, local agenda that we also have as a, um, an association. Um, what's interesting to know about um, Eastern Germany is the fact that it has an extremely high influx of renewable energies because the capacities that have been set up in Germany, especially in wind, um, are located around uh, Eastern Germany with actually the highest capacity per inhabitant because it's also a fairly rural area that we're talking about in Eastern Germany. And also, there are only two areas in Germany that have a historical hydrogen pipeline, and one of them is located in eastern Germany. The other one is in the, what you would call as Ruhrgebiet, or the Ruhr area, so an industrial area of the um, 20th century. And due to the pipeline that we'd like to put into good use using green hydrogen within it, and due to the chemical industry, which is also very strong in this area, we do see a business case coming up, say, within the next few years. It's a mid-term project. I do have to say that within the projects that I've seen so far, especially in Germany, um, it is very hard to construct business cases yet. Um, this is also a question that I'd like to ask um, to ask you, because I've looked into some of the fundings that you've done, and some of them address specifically the question, where in Europe can we find um, a marketplace or a business case for hydrogen and mobility? And it'd be interested, I'd be interested in, in hearing what you've found out so far. <laughs> OK, Mr. Wieberg, just go ahead. So, so is Leipzig a good area for, for projects? Well, actually, um, we are just conducting a study right at the moment. It's a kind of early business models for uh, electrolyzers. Uh, the study will conclude somewhere in June, middle of June, probably during the European Sustainability Week. Uh, we will announce the results. But um, we have kind of three areas or three business models that we believe that there is possibility. Mm -hmm. If we talked about mobility, uh, the first one is uh, we see rather like, um, let's say, demi-centralized uh, electrolyzers. So, for example, an electrolyzer who can uh, bring hydrogen to like four or five different uh, refueling stations. Yes. So there seems to be a, a case because if you put at the moment the electrolyzer directly at the station, still there it's too expensive, there's not enough uh, take on, on, on hydrogen, take off of hydrogen. So that's one of the business cases then. One very interesting project we are now running in Denmark, in Aalborg, is actually the High Balance project. This is a 1.2 megawatt uh, from Hydrogenics there. And what is happening is there for grid balancing. So there we will really see uh, if we can use the excess energy, the green energy from the wind, um, and how can we sell it? Uh, how can we trade it on the electricity market? So actually in that project, there is an uh, electricity trader included, and they will, we will learn from them. We will see if it really works, if really there is a business model, and what has to change. So this will be a very, very important project also for the European Commission yeah. to understand what are all the factors that uh, are from importance. Uh, so we are working on that, but there seems to be some 
uh, business. Also in the food industry, there might be some uh, business cases there as well. Dr. Uh, Goldemar asked you right away, uh, but maybe the audience doesn't know uh, really what what uh, what kind of projects you're supporting and what's what's behind uh, uh, the the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking. Can you explain that a little bit to the audience, please? Well, first of all, um, basically the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking started in 2008. Uh, it's a public-private partnership with one hand the European Commission and then Hydrogen Europe, which is uh, about 106 uh, big industries and then 65 research institutes as well. Uh, together, we have just very simple. One aim is to uh, develop hydrogen uh, fuel cell products and bring them as soon as possible to the market uh, so that really the customer can experience the, uh, those products and at the same time to reach the European goals. So we have in total around 203 projects now running for a total budget of 750 million euro. Uh, we have two main pillars. We work around energy and this is about green hydrogen production, electrolyzers, but also storage. Uh, we work around um, also on stationary work, so using the hydrogen and so on to produce electricity and heat. Micro CHPs as the energy pillar. We then working on the transport pillar. Yes. And very simple transport is every means that brings you from point A to point B. <laughs> Airplanes, boats, trucks, forklifts, everything what moves which has wheels or something like that. So <laughs> we have a lot of projects in that. And you can just simply look in our website uh, to see what kind of projects we have there or contact us later on. But uh, Dr. Goldamer, you said you have the, one of the pipelines in Germany, the other one in the rural area. But unfortunately, this pipeline doesn't end at a refueling station. So uh, if you want to refuel your fuel cell cars, you have to go either to, well, to Berlin or to Nuremberg. That's the nearest one, isn't it? Yes, you're correct. And um, well, That might be a nice project for you. Huh? But well, it's true, and I suffer personally because if I, if I rent a fuel cell car in Berlin, I can pretty much only take it to Hamburg. I cannot really take it to any other fueling station, refueling stations. But I do know that there are some coming up. We also have a regime in Germany where we're building them up yeah. to make them more accessible and to make places like Berlin, which on the map is rather remote from the rest of the German um, bigger cities, more accessible for, for a fuel cell mobility option. Um, at my institute, for instance, we're working on a project where we're considering um, public transport as a trigger for mobility with hydrogen, just because we need someone initializing the infrastructure mm. use. And we are thinking if we build up hydrogen mobility, say, by buses in several bigger German cities, they will produce demand for a hub and a refueling station. And when there is a refueling station, obviously, there is ground for more private consumption of fuel cell cars. So that's the kind of work that I'd like to see more. Uh, I would like science. to open up the discussion. If anybody has a question, just raise your hand. I'll be with the microphone right with you. And you can discuss with my interview partners here on stage if you want to. Uh, if that's not the case, I follow on. Uh, Mr. Diewald, I, I know you when you uh, came into contact with the hydrogen fuel cell community, when you built up a power to gas uh, plant, one of the first in Germany. And I still remember that you had to transport your hydrogen from Prenzlau, as far as I yes. can remember, up to Berlin uh, because there was the nearest uh, refueling yeah. station. Uh, situation would be different today. Yeah? You could even build up a um, refueling station in Prenzlau now. Yes, of course. Um, but there are not so many uh, fuel cell cars. It's not a little yet, bit of not problem. Yet. Not yet. Dr. Goldhammer said. It's but now it's, uh, you're right. It changed a little bit. Now the first uh, fuel cell car is in Prenzlau. So it needs a filling station. In the moment, it's a little bit uh, a between uh, solution. But you can fill this car in Prenzlau, it's all, but on the, in the private area, it's not a public area. Um, so on the other side, we transport until now the, the, um, the hydrogen to Total, to the filling station, so that they can use it for the public transport and for the lot of cars, of few cell cars in, in, in Berlin. I, I think it is nice to have these projects, you know, like to show what we can do in 20 years time or so. But uh, what we really need in this technology field, we are waiting so long, is our projects now that really work economically. Do you see some of them? Yeah, I think we are really, really soon or we can get it very, very, very fast. It depends a little bit more on the regulations, on the European regulations and the national regulations. 
We have a pro or we, we have targets uh, to reduce the uh, greenhouse emission by the fuels, and in the moment we use uh, biofuels for that. And we have learned in the last years that the biofuels are not every time save the world and save the climate. We get some problems. It's a in uh, e look problem, an indirect uh, land use change. And we see it by palm oil or other things like uh, you, if you go to the, in Europe to the land, you see everywhere, everywhere the wraps. Uh, and that is really a problem for, for, our, yeah, for our nature. And on the other side for the climate, we see what happens with the big forests in South America and so on. And there is the idea to say, okay, why we don't use this green, or this green electricity? We switch off very often in, in, in North uh, Europe. The, the wind turbines and use this electricity, produce green hydrogen, and use this hydrogen in the refineries. And we had made a lot of uh, calculations, and we see that we are on the same price level to reduce one ton of carbon, uh, like with biofuels. So that is economic. Uh, it depends only a little bit, what I said in the beginning, on the regulations, the regulator, the European Union, uh, Commission, and then the member states have to say, okay, we allowed it. We accept this offset, this calculation, like biofuels. Uh, and I think that is an in interest of European uh, economic. We use energy from Europe, not imported. We give an economic uh, business case for new technologies. That means for, for engineers and so on. And it's the energy from tomorrow for the fuel cell cars. So it makes really sense. And yeah, we hope that it really comes now in the next 12 months. I, yesterday I had uh, Mr. Contanelesto here on, on the stage and he is very well uh, uh, aware of this, this, uh, this problem. And I have the expectation they will solve that problem very soon. I hope so. I hope so, yeah. With your help, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, Dr. Borov, you raised your hand. Uh, yes, I mean, we are talking about these sector couplings. And it is the fact that in, in many places now, there's uh, taxes when you move energy from one mm -hmm. sector to another sector. And of course, we have to do something about it. There is, uh, by, there is regions in Europe where actually conditions are already starting to improve. And we have seen in Denmark that the government is now really starting to address this issue. And I think that is really going to be a huge leverage for, uh, for these uh, technologies to come in. And, we, uh, and I, if you look at electrolyzer, for example, you, of course you produce hydrogen, that's the main product. But you also actually, is, uh, there is valuable heat that we can use in the district heating system. And actually, if we put green electricity into the electrolyzer, we get green hydrogen, but we also get green heat. And we can actually sell that to help lower the cost of the hydrogen. So when we look at these business cases, it looks very favorable. And actually, we believe in large scale, we can, we can very soon produce hydrogen at two euro per, uh, per kilogram based on uh, uh, energy mix in the power system, which is getting more and more green. So I think it's, it's very near term that actually these projects uh, can start to show really uh, commercial results also. And that's what we have to push for now to give the last push to show that this works and then hopefully we can get it straightened out in the rest of the region so, so we get these taxes away through the sector coupling because otherwise it will not happen. Mr. Bieberg, would you like to comment on that? Well, yeah, we see the similar thing happening now in buses. So, you know, yeah. but since uh, five, six years, we have been uh, pushing to develop and to put in place uh, hydrogen buses here and there. And we also see there that uh, now that the price of hydrogen starts to drop mm. uh, we have from five to six euro per kilogram, there the CTO, I mean, the cost of total ownership of a bus yeah. uh, is really comparable with a diesel engine. Yeah. And we see we are getting there right now. So that's also why we see big cities like London, Köln, mm. uh, Hamburg really going for hydrogen buses because it starts to make sense economically. And uh, we, yes. we have uh, now a call open uh, which, uh, for hydrogen buses, which was oversubscribed. We had more than 300 applications for hydrogen buses. We could only fund a few of them. But you see really that there's a huge market uptake and it's coming. Not only hydrogen buses, as I've learned, uh, also hydrogen trains coming up. Uh, yeah. You're also yes. supporting that. Mr. Yes. Niewald, you would yeah. like to say that? I think that is another market. This is the trains. And if you see it, you buy a train for 30 years, your operation time. So you, now if you start to buy a train, you buy it for 2050. 
And if you see the climate goals in 2050, is zero emission. So I think the, the, uh, uh, the governments, the region governments, are really now for the decision what kind of train I have to buy. Because and if you buy a train now, you run it 30 yeah. years at least. Yeah. Uh -huh. So and so I think uh, what I have learned from from the train manufacturers is what Mr. Bubik said. It's it's on the same price level like a diesel, and today, and I'm sure, perhaps it's to worth this uh, view, but I'm sure that the diesel price will be increased in the next 30 years. I think a very important element to add on that is that actually it's about the electrification. So basically 42% of the European railroad is not yet electrified. Okay? Right. So the cost for one kilometer of uh, putting these cables and so on, uh, it's about 1.2 million euro per kilometer. So you can calculate how many kilometers you still have to pay. Such so a huge amount of money. You know? So it's basically it's more cheaper to just put a, a train with hydrogen tanks and fill up with a, and put in a stack than with really buying a uh, electrical train and put all these uh, wiring. So that's where the business case today is already there. Only where we need to work on is on the regulations to make the certification much faster because it's a very new technology and still a lot of governments are not yet prepared for this regulation for the trains with hydrogen. But we are working on that. Another wonderful project for... for uh The Saxony area, <laughs> wouldn't it, for Hypers? Well, running a, 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 one of these trains, which are planned to run in Lower Saxony already at the end of this year, also between, let's say, Dresden and Leipzig, and uh, refuel it at Bitterfeld. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an expert on trains, but I like the project. Um, mm. What we look more into is individual mobility, because that's what we, you know, we were, we've been trained to do. My colleagues are... Um, car engineers so they, they look more into individual mobility and it's I think that's one of the big issues we should tackle anyhow um, obviously from the engineering side there is already there are already many solutions there but it's the acceptance as in the demand is not rising as fast as as it could that's true both for battery electric vehicles in Germany as well as fuel cell vehicles so um, I'd really like to look into that more. I'm also thinking that it's not only the diesel prices or the gas prices, it probably has something to do with the carbon prices too. If carbon is essentially for free, um, I don't see the transition going as fast as it could. So we are at the legal pr problems again. Uh, you, Mr. Diewald, are also a spokesperson for, and, uh, for the expert commission performing energy. As far as I know the situation, if we want to produce green hydrogen, it is we take the energy out of the grid in Germany, pay uh, EEG uh, for that, renewable energy uh, law, uh, we pay for that, and we put the hydrogen into the grid and pay once again. You have to put the hydrogen in the electricity grid again, then you have to pay. <laughs> okay. But if you use it in, a, in another sector like transport or so on, then you have to pay the additional cost for renewable energy system. We should, and that should is a little start bit that crazy. for oil as well. You know, when, yeah. when the tanker comes to the harbor, we, we should let them pay the first time. And if it comes yeah. to the, the refueling station the second time and so on. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> not fair. It really no, is it's not, not, yeah. not fair, especially. If we really help the electricity system with the electrolyzer to produce hydrogen, to, to make a demand side management, to stabilize the electricity grid, and then you have to pay for this service. It's a little bit crazy. Normally, you get money for service. So I think uh, we have to change this, uh, this system. But I expect, of course, we have to accept and, and, and agree and, and have need to respect for that. That is new technology. We bring it now in the old energy market system. That is very old. It grow and grow and it's complicated. And now it's with, it's more flexible, um, more complex, more difficult. And of course, the politicals have to understand it and have to make the right market design. That is not so easy. And I'm sure now we have voting in this year in Germany. But after that, I expect really that we get a new market design in Germany because we have a lot of problems and then we will solve this issue. And that's exactly the your work you do at your association yeah. of hydrogen fuel cells. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and today, uh, for instance, the chairwoman of the Greens in Germany uh, is here, Simone de Peter. She will visit you and hopefully you can convince her to support <laughs> your, your ideas. Uh, but you have reached already some, uh, some goals, didn't you? 
Yeah, I think the first one is not really what you can read in black or white. It's uh, the awareness of hydrogen and the political surrounding is very high now. In Germany especially, they learned, and they have to understand that hydrogen is a communicator between the sectors and is very helpful. And that is not only battery. Hydrogen will be, have a big part in this energy transition world. And that is the first effort what we have. Then there are small efforts, especially what you told. If I built the first, I was yeah, very involved, the first power to hydrogen power plant, it was nearly forbidden to use green hydrogen and use it then in a, in a biomass uh, CHP unit and produce electricity again. You lost all the benefits for the CHP unit. That is change in the law. Then we have some uh, wordings in German laws. There's, uh, you can use it in a business, but it's written in the law. Yeah, that is our target. We have to promote more the green hydrogen. And the same is on the uh, fuel quality directive on the EU level. And I think we was very well involved there and give a lot of support and makes proposals. And now there's, of course, it is only, yeah, Envision there that written we need more green hydrogen in the fuel sector that is not only biofuel, so that is the first effort, that is the, the foundation. And now, of course, we need the, the right regulations, the accept wordings that we can use it really in the business. But of course, that is step by step, and so 50% is done. And now the rest of the 50, okay, the rest 50% comes in the next. I think latest in 2020, if you see now the winter package, yes. there's green hydrogen really, a lot of wordings in, yeah. the, in the winter package. Yeah. Yeah. I think what is very important on the, for the European Commission is to have a definition about what is green hydrogen. Yeah. Because if you would go into the, this room and you would ask the people, they would all have a different definition. So what happened last year is by the end of uh, last year, we have agreed with the whole industry what is green hydrogen. And that's very, very important. It was the first time that they all agree what is green hydrogen. Okay, so the definition is there. So what we will do now next is really to set up a system where you can book your green hydrogen because it's all about guarantees of origin of green hydrogen, so where you can book and claim back. So once this system is set up, then we can ask to the, to the policy makers and the European Commission, well, look, we have, a, we have a definition, we have a system, so you can now input it into the regulation. And they are waiting for that, because yesterday uh, from DGNR, it was very clearly, they are waiting for that, and we are working as fast as possible to make this happen. Well, Dr. Borup, my definition of clean hydrogen is it is this hydrogen produced by electrolyzers coming from renewable energies. Uh, would you have another de de definition? No, I think that's, uh, that's, that's the obvious uh, foundation of the green hydrogen is that we have to you know, make sure that the origin of the electricity is actually coming from these sources. Yeah. And we have a system for that. So, so you actually, we each kilowatt hour, we know where it, was, where it was produced. So we now just have to move these certificates through the system and into, attach it to the kilograms of hydrogen. So, so I think it's, there's a straight, road ahead how to how this can be done and um, and we we just need to get get through the decision making and yeah. and alignment in the industries part yeah. no i mean this is the whole uh, the whole point is from how is your electricity made is it made from renewables or not and i mean this is the same discussion for hydrogen cars battery cars because your battery car i mean it can be very clean but it can be very very dirty as well so like in china it yeah, doesn't first. matter it's all about yeah. how you produce it and this is why we need to have these guarantees of origin yeah and um, i think if it really comes in a big scale uh, dr borup uh, the, this this hydrogen economy we would say and all the big power to gas projects uh, we need very large uh, um, electrolyzers i know you're already in the megawatt scale but but uh, there might be an, an end to that are, are you ready to really change the economy into a hydrogen economy yes i think uh, what we see is that you have a, you have very good economic of scale in the electrolyzer manufacturing so there is a huge potential, and we will see that as it's going to go on for quite a while, there's a lot of opportunity to lower the cost. And we have seen that in, in wind and solar, that when you really start to kick off this engine of manufacturing, 
you would have people competing and you will see the cost coming further down. Uh, so we have, we have proposed here in our stand a 400 megawatt electrolyzer system. And, and actually there we get down to uh, around 400 euro per kilowatt uh, capex. But, so it's but, already but, half of what people are paying today. But you didn't start last year. So you're here on this group exercise in 23 years already. Yes. So, so you're you quite <laughs> experienced. You know? That's true. But, but we will see. Uh, I mean, you would, I, I think people would be surprised in 10 years what the cost is of this technology because we're still starting at pretty low volumes at the moment. So there's a huge potential. Mr. Diebel, what, what price do you expect? Yeah, I think the, the technology is ready. We have the two megawatt stacks or one and two megawatt stack. All the manufacturers have uh, stacks like this size. And of course, I heard very often, yeah, but if you make now fuels, you need 400 megawatts. Yes, you need total capacity perhaps for 400 megawatt, but the stack size for 2 megawatt, we see it in the wind business. Yeah. The wind turbines have 2 megawatt, and we have in Germany 40,000 megawatts, so it works. You need not one stack with 100 megawatts. So I think the, that is what I said every time to the politicals, because they said, yeah, okay, make a research project additional, and we give some funding for research and development. No, the, the technology is ready, and of course we can develop better we can make it better, more efficiency. Yeah, we develop on the cars today, on the combustion engine, each day. And we spend some money in research. Years already, yeah. yes. mm -hmm. And here is now, it's not discussion, we need not more development to start. We can start, mm. and we need business, and in the business time, of course, we make it better. But now we have to start. Dr. Goldammer, you just raised your hand. You have the last word in this round. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> I was going to say that. Um, now, the scales actually make a lot of sense to me. When I look at the German energy system, um, and say you're a wind park operator, and you operate a wind farm where, the, where you have uh, several megawatts of wind power coming in um, in a fluctuating way, and you're extremely worried about your prognosis, right? In the German regime, at least, um, if uh, there is a wind break only for a few minutes, this can be very hurtful economically for your portfolio. An electrolyzer that can take off, mm. say, additional wind at, in a, in a, or additional electricity in a moment where it, would not, it wasn't prognosed, it can be extremely, extremely interesting financially for your portfolio. Mm. So in that sense where Germany is building up all this fluctuating energy and is still making everyone pay for prognosis in corrections. I see actually another business case coming up, maybe that is similar to the one that you mentioned. Um, and that's basically the energy transition related electrolyzer scales that we then essentially need. Very good. Thank you very much. I, I am very sorry to interrupt this discussion now because we could go on for an hour or so. Uh, but I think we touched some very interesting points already. So uh, keep in touch with us. Thank you very much for your uh, interest in this discussion, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you very much for you here on my panel. Thank you. Thanks, too.